Yeah, uh, one of my relatives uh, served in World War II and, and some of them uh, didn't come back. But uh, my uncle told me a story about, he died about 20 years ago. And he was at Battle of the Bulge and he came around a corner and uh, the uh, German soldier was, had him dead to rights. Uh, he, he had his gun down. And the German soldier, out of a moment of compassion, uh, out of the blue, just put his gun down and they were just staring at each other. And then uh, another American took out the German soldier. So he, he relayed that to me and had a powerful impact on, uh, on uh, you know, brought it, brought it back to me because I was a history major in college, not anymore. But uh, what the thing that really I want to take away from the war, especially about how, what you talked about in the last, the, the guy on this the page there uh, on the front uh, uh, cover didn't want his name. How do you communicate now in the age of entitlement this sense of shared sacrifice? How, how would they do it? How would you do it as a historian? Because that seems like to me what we've lost in this country, that sense of shared sacrifice at this age of entitlement. I just, how, how do you do that as a historian? Um, that's a big topic. <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, from my point of view, and now I'm a biographer of Franklin Roosevelt, so you have to understand that. Um, I think one of the things we had, first of all, we had a country that had just been through the Depression. It was used that it was accustomed to sacrifice. And I think we had a president who understood that terrible sacrifices were going to be required and made that very clear to the country from the first speech at, when war was declared. He said, I regret to tell you there a very great many American lives have been lost. And within days he was explaining that everybody, that taxes were going to go up. We had to win this that everybody was going to be involved. Um, I think that has a lot to do with it. I, I think you've hit a, a central thing, and, and one of the things, if, if we could say that very simply we wanted to bear witness to what took place in that war, we also realized that what emanates out of a series and the book is that sense of shared sacrifice that we made ourselves richer as individuals and communities and a country by giving things up. Today we are entitled, we are acquisitive, we don't want to give up anything. Our leaders have not asked us to do anything. After 9-11 we were asked to go shopping. Um, and we have this opportunity now, six years out, to have perhaps transformed ourselves in the wake of 9-11, in the way in three years Franklin Roosevelt and his leadership was able to transform not only the, the dynamics of the geopolitical threat, uh, but also the warp and weft of America in every sense of the word. And it came from the willingness of Americans to give out. Now I think it's not as hard as you suggest it is, sir. And this is where I think that a, a, a bit of optimism is required. Despite how rich we are now, despite this acquisitiveness, despite this fact that we're not willing to give anything up and our politicians sense this and don't want to rock the boat and ask us to do things, I think we still feel a poverty of spirit. I think we feel disconnected. I think we yearn for community. We yearn for community. And that we investigate history, in this case, the Second World War, because we find in its examples guideposts to our future behavior. And I don't think there's a person within the sound of my voice that doesn't realize that if their leaders had asked them to do something, they would have gladly done it in the cause that we had before us. And so I think, I, I think that though you are right to decry a certain softness and entitlement, as you say now, I think there is a reservoir of potential that will permit us, I hope, in future circumstances uh, to transcend the kind of petty dialectics of red state and blue state, of north, south, east, west, young and old, of, of just that interior prison of not wishing to be connected to the other. And that we will, perhaps unfortunately through dire circumstances, but perhaps um, through something else, be able to liberate ourselves from this prison and, and live out, as Dr. King said, the true meaning of our creed. You know?
sounds as the, uh, the core of this film is, is really a brilliant idea. And I wonder if you could uh, say something about how, out of all the towns and cities in the United States, you came to select these four. Well, it, it may look good now, <laughs> but it was uh, just like what they say about legislation just up the road a little bit, you know? It's like sausage. It may taste good, but you don't want to know how it's made. Um, we thought early on the suggestion of a beloved colleague that we could tell this story with one town. And we initially went to Waterbury, Connecticut, which had transformed itself overnight, brass city since the 19th century, into this war machine and had sent a number of men into various combats and had, 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 most important to us in a way, preserved its records quite magnificently. But a quick study showed us that we couldn't possibly get the range of combat experience that we wanted to have to do justice uh, to the war, and we began to think that perhaps we should expand this to more towns. We had already read what to all of our minds is what was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, memoir uh, of the Second World War called With the Old Breed by a man named Eugene Sledge who had seen horrific action on Peleliu, that's Sunday night, and Okinawa, that's Tuesday night. Um, and the honesty uh, was a revelation to us. And he had just passed away. He was from Mobile, Alabama. And when we went there, his family um, uh, introduced us to his best friend, Sid Phillips, who you've already met in the series, and his sister, Catherine, who is our, one of our Greek choruses in the film, and their circle of friends. And we enlarged our circle there. We were able to get an actor, a fine actor, Josh Lucas, to read um, Eugene Sledge's writing. And we had a second town. We were not after in our film pursuing any particular ethnic group. We, we, knew, we knew we couldn't tell every story. We were after specific combat experience. Except we wanted to tell the story of Japanese Americans because they had this experience. American citizens who were put in internment camps and then later asked to volunteer for specific combat duty, cannon fodder. And that was such a hypocritically complicated story that we felt we needed to tell it. And so that required us to take a West Coast town, and we didn't want to do familiar towns in any case, ones in which our audience, and most important us, would have any baggage or preconception. And we're so thankful that we told uh, Sacramento, because it not only brought along some amazing Japanese-American stories, but many, many other uh, amazing human beings. In fact, Sacramento is represented more than any other town by, by the people in, in, our, in our film and book. And then we were thrashing about Waterbury, Mobile, and Sacramento have about 100,000 each. They're utterly transformed, but we knew we wanted to get a small Midwestern town now. We'd settled on four towns, and the geographical distribution required that it be Midwest. We wanted it to be small uh, so that we could get that sense of texture of a small town place, and we had already met Quentin Annanson, the fighter pilot, who was such an important part of our series, who's lived outside of the district for 50 years, and he was from Laverne. And we went there and, and found Al McIntosh, uh, uh, the editor of the Rock County Star Herald, uh, which Tom Hanks brings to life. Al McIntosh died of old age, as did Eugene Sledge. Uh, and uh, we were able to get Tom Hanks to read this, uh, this magnificent commentary. He had a weekly column called More or Less Daily Chaff and brought the war alive, not just the physical transformations, you know, Laverne didn't change that much on the outward, but inside it was radical and impressive and tragic and heroic and devastating in every sense of the word. And we were able to find, by studying that small town and with the help of Al McIntosh, to do that. And it looks pretty good in retrospect, but it was um, a long uh, process, which uh, Lynn and Sarah Botstein, who were saying, you guys should stand up and, and uh, take credit for 